Tina a Welcome to the second talk in our Mammal Peace series for Biosecurity Bonanza 2022. It's my pleasure today to introduce Iber Yockney, a field ecologist at Manaki Whenua. Iber has a keen interest in logistically challenging wildlife ecology work in New Zealand's backcountry. His areas of specific interest include conservation biology, ungulate management, care research, biodiversity, wildlife capture, telemetry and disease management. Iber will be presenting preliminary outcomes from a study of feral cat movements in eastern beech forests of the South Island, in which 20 GPS collars were deployed on feral cats across two sites in the Horden and Hope Valleys over a 12 month period. This work was developed as an initial pilot trial following known feral cat predation events on Kia and the high alpine and bush of the eastern beech forests. Iva and his co-author Dr Laura Young have been following the fate of Kia through radio telemetry studies east of Maine Divide for four years and recovering predated carcasses for DNA testing. The positive identification of feral cats as predators of adult Kia off the nest was a motivation to learn more about feral cats in this environment to aid both control and to support quantifying the spatial risk that feral cats threaten in this environment. This work's been internally funded by Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. A Q&A session will follow this talk. I encourage you to submit questions during the presentation. We will try and get through them all, but if not, Iba will respond by email to any questions we don't get to today. I'll now hand over to Iva to share his presentation on movements of feral cats in the Eastern Beach Forests of South, the South Island. Kia ora tato. Um, thanks for the introduction, Sam. You've uh, wrapped that up fairly well. Uh, I'm presenting the beginnings of work started out by myself and colleague Laura Young, and also with the help of Cecilia Latham, who will be calling on for her expertise in um, spatial ecology. I'm just going to um, introduce myself here and then turn the video camera off. I'm actually in isolation at home and bandwidth isn't too good here, so um, I'll just flick that off and carry on with the talk. So just by way of background, uh, Laura and I have both been involved in long-term care monitoring studies uh, east of the main divide looking at care survivorship and uh, in particular through a beach masting event of 2019 through to 2021. Um, during the study, depredation of care through predation by stoats and feral cats accounted for the loss of some 40% of the study birds. There was also irrefutable evidence of feral cats killing care through a combination of both field sign uh, predator DNA anal analysis where carcasses are swabbed and DNA is taken off to show what uh, predator species killed the care and also skull canine analysis which is looking at bite marks in, in bones or the skull. Around 50% of the predation events were attributed to feral cats and um, there seemed to be a real west to east gradient of predation risk so when we were they're tracking these care as soon as they move from sort of western parts near the divide out to the edgy east sides we um yeah we're a, re a, re a wee bit um you know scared about what was going to happen to them and generally they did get predated the further east they went so this next slide uh when it comes through um I'm just gonna put this great quote up here by Josh Kemp, who sums it up so well. Um, when rodents crash and burn, then it's the care's turn. Uh, I'm sure he won't mind me using this. And by, by this, it means that uh, predation of care during normal years was fairly low. However, following a masting event where rodent numbers boom, um, following shortly after by presumably feral cats, but definitely stoats, um, their numbers peak and then rodent numbers catastrophically drop when there's no more seed. And then there are a load of predators out there and their main source of diet is gone and then they prey switch. So hence they, um, hence that quote there, when rodents crash and burn, then it's the care's turn. 
Uh, little was known of feral cat movements, distribution, density, and spatial risk in this environment. It was really surprising for us to find feral cat kills at such high altitudes. Um, seeing this on almost a weekly or fortnightly basis, Laura and I decided um, we needed to know more about feral cats in this environment and start addressing the feral cat issue. So together Laura's interest was more in spatial ecology and, and maybe the threat of feral cats in this environment to, to wildlife, whereas my interest was in refining control techniques and effort through knowing your enemy. The more you know, the, the better you can control them. But combined, we decided that the best and the fastest way to gain this knowledge was through a GPS movement study. But in doing the study, we were in a really uneasy position. On one hand, catching and releasing feral cats for the bigger picture gain in knowledge, and I think a lot of researchers find this um, uneasy throughout their careers. On the other hand, you know, we're still seeing the carnage that predators were causing to care, hence the title short-term pain for long-term gain. And just on that note, while care predation was the catalyst for our motivation in this research, this is not a story about care. This is about feral cats in our mountain landscape where kea are just a sentinel species of pre presumably a large range of native fauna falling victim to feral cats in this environment. In fact, I think probably an adult kea um, is likely quite a formidable prey for a feral cat. So once we had secured funding, uh, we set about utilising two study sites that um, coincided with our care monitoring. So they overlapped with the care telemetry study. We chose the Hope Valley and the Horton Valley. Both of these were reasonably edgy, but they overlapped with care habitat. They ran right back to the main divide and had a fair amount of contiguous beech forest within them. So these photos are of the Hope Valley, these uh, three pictures here, just showing the sort of river flats and, and beech forest looking up and down the river. The second site was the Horden Valley, where we tra trapped from July through to October, uh, trapping mainly the river flats and the fringe country, so sort of up both sides of the river and around the fringes. Um, our goal was to GPS collar 10 feral cats at both sites, uh, which we achieved. Uh, just before I get into trapping, I, I've got to add in at this point, it's important to note that these are feral cats we're talking about. The definition being that they are born and bred in these areas and they've not had any physical association with human. So as opposed to stray cats or domestic cats, so when we talk about feral cats in this environment, we're talking about perhaps multi-generational animals from these areas. So we set about um, live capture trapping with cage traps. We set them approximately 200 metres apart, up both sides of the river valleys. Uh, we had no idea of what spatial distances to put these traps, but figured that was reasonable. Um, baited them with fresh rabbit and salmon feed pellets. The average weights of um, cats were 2.7 kilos for females and 4.3 kilos for males. They were predominantly tabby, although we did get one uh, black cat, which I'll talk about later on. We also had multiple recaptures uh, with one adult male cat caught five times. So we had 17 recaptures. Uh, lots of people sort of said, oh, once you get them in a trap and put a collar on them, you'll never never get them again. But um, they seemed quite trappable and, and retrappable. Once we had caught them in the trap, they were uh, we injected them with Zolotol to sedate them, ear tag them, weighed them, took a scat sample. If there's a scat sample available, uh, then we could match the scat sample with a particular individual. Um, and we fitted a VHF GPS collar to them, let them go safely, somewhere warm where they weren't going to roll down a bank into a river or whatever. Um, and of I must add too that all of these manipulations were covered by our Manaki Whenua. Uh, Animal Ethics Committee. It's also important to note that these areas weren't subjected to any uh, feral cat control, so it 
helped us in some form of our conscience, like I was talking about before, that nothing was being done about these feral cats anyway at that point in time. So if we weren't doing the study, uh, nothing would have changed anyway. So just in terms of GPS, VHF collar technology, we chose the low-tech light track series of uh, collars. Um, we chose two different sizes, just so we could cover different weights of cats. Um, the, the heavier one, 120 gram, took a fix every hour, day and night, for up to a year. And the lighter version took a fix every four hours. We set these two swift GPS fixes, and that's a swift fix is basically taking a snapshot of the satellite through the constellation. And rather than processing the fix through an algorithm on board the collar, it was post-processed on a computer later on, and that saves battery life. These collars could be remote downloaded via foot or fixed wing aircraft or by helicopter. And some of the collars had a time release drop-off fitted on them. So just in this picture here, you'll notice, I'll talk in the next slide, but one of them's got a full aerial and one's got a broken off aerial. We had, did have issues on all of our collars losing aerials. So here's an example of downloading on foot. Um, with the aerials broken, we needed to stalk in on each cat quietly, uh, download the data off the collars. We also, initially it was, um, so they download onto this on this commander unit. Initially they were excellent via fixed wing aircraft. We could track care and do a couple of loops over these and download all that data off each individual cat and it worked really well. But once the aerials had all broken, uh, reduced that um, significantly. So we were down to foot and we also used a lightweight Cabri G2 helicopter to hover and download, which was very successful as well. So despite the difficulties with the collar hardware, which increased the cost of obtaining the data, the collars have actually performed really well. We've collected a huge amount of data and their battery life has been as good or better than what we expected. So we've acquired 4,359 days of movement data and half the collars are still out there, still collecting data. Uh, within our team at Manaki Whenua, we have specialised skill sets in GIS and spatial ecology. And throughout designing this um, project and going forward with data analysis, we're drawing on the expertise of Cecilia and um, Dave Latham. So we said we haven't done any data analysis yet, but it would be unfair to at least show you something that's coming in. So I'll go through a few slides of raw data. So this is just straight off the collars. There's been no analysis done of these yet. So this is the um, what we call the Black Panther. It was the only non-tabby cat that uh, we caught and that's his nickname. So we've got 336 days of data showing here. Um, this is the Hope Valley that he's that he's in. Um, his home range length is some 23 kilometers from one end to the other. Spends a lot of time down on these flats, another sort of area here, another piece here. But he, um, hopefully that's showing up on the screen, but he's also been right through to the west coast um, over the main divide and into the head of the Tūtaikuri headwaters. So just showing the distance they sort of range, um, these male cats. This next one um, we called the Alpine Specialist and we've got 245 days of data off him. Um, and Laura and I collared this male cat in the Horton Valley floor in September 2021 we had no idea where he was going between tracking events. So a, a hint was provided when we radio tracked him from the plane, when we were care tracking, uh, we found him in an adjacent catchment some nine kilometers away. So um, this is the cat here that Laura's holding up that we've nicknamed the Alpine Specialist. And the picture of all the dots are just this one cat over 245 days. The green dots are really good fixes that have got lots of satellite and 
um, really good accuracy. The red dots we've yet to go through, so they're probably low on satellites and their accuracy could be plus or minus a bit. And that's part of the analysis that we need to go through. So for those of you who know this area, Andrew's on the left, East Branch, Horden in the middle, the Horden with the Horden hut, and the Poulter faces on the front there. So that this cat's been spending a lot of time in the Alpine environment. We don't really know if he's an Alpine specialist as such, but certainly spent a lot of time up there and going back down to the main valley. Um, so this is when I need to draw on Tiffany <laughs> to hopefully animate this slide if possible. And um, just while we wait for that, um, I'll introduce this slide and then, and then you can watch it unfold. Hopefully it works. The red dot. Sorry, I got muted there. So I'll just introduce the slide. So while we wait, um, the red dots are every tenth fix. So every 10 hours of movement. Hopefully this is working. So every 10 hours, you got got that dot there, the way he was moving around the environment. Um, this is that Alpine specialist over that 245 days. And he's covering a, a fair amount of terrain, altitudinal, making large altitudinal changes. And he's uh, seemingly in some sort of a circuit and always returning back to the main valley floor between forays. So hopefully I can uh, get back control here. Yeah, so I'm not, not sure how well that came across, but this slide here is just to show again the scale of his movements. Um, the main range at the back uh, that he was always up and down and over. So right out this main range, all the way around, up, down, over, across, always back into the Horden and back up onto the tops of it again. So one of our questions was um, by trapping the valley floor, do we put it at risk the alpine cats? And this cat was trapped and killed by Doc on the 15th of May, so just a few weeks ago in the Horden Valley as part of their now predator control operation for feral cats. And that kind of answers that question, at least for this individual, that um, yes, you could target him for, by trapping the valley floor, even though he spends a lot of time on the tops. This next slide is all of the combined data to date of feral cats in the Horden Valley. Um, there's a strong preference for edginess. However, a couple of the cats definitely hunt the alpine. So you've got the, the alpine specialist, which we, um, which I just showed you, but there's, you've got another one here that comes through Walker Pass and into the Otahaki, to the west coast, um, back around up into the Southern Valley. It was the same cat. Um, and so they're included in crossing the main divide into the west coast. Also, we have a, a feral cat here that's going between Cass and the Horden, and presumably he's crossing the Mount White Bridge. So um, it just shows that st structures um, are another way that cats can get around that environment, because I doubt whether he'd be uh, crossing the Waimakariri River on a regular basis. Um, he'd be going across the bridge. Hey, this um, next slide's all the data from the Upper Hope. Um, it's just the upper part of it. There's a lot of data from down around the corner. I'm not sure if this mouse shows up, but but down the main Hope Valley too, there's a lot of um, data. So this is 10 cats in, in this area. Um, one of my questions has always been, you know, 
how many fixes do we lose in the forest? So you can see there's a bit of a transit route where they go through a low saddle between the upper and the lower hope. It doesn't look to be as many green fixes through there or um, up in the forest to any sort of altitude. So there are green fixes in places, but when you zoom in on it, they're normally in pretty open slips or clearings or creeks or something. So maybe we are underrepresenting the amount of time they're spending in um, solid forest as well. They seem to have a strong edge effect, these ones, and we didn't have any alpine sort of cats up around the tops, even though we did have Kia um, killed by feral cats on the tops nearby. One of the other questions is, you know, we may have biased our sample by trapping cats in the valley floor in, in both of those sites actually, but the reality is, is of cage traps, live trapping up on the tops, it's a pretty logistically big um, challenging project. And this was mainly just a initial pilot trial. So data analysis, um, going forwards, there's a raft of questions that could be answered by these data, um, mostly only constrained by either funding or your imagination. So I'll run through a few ideas that we've thought about here um, at the beginning of the work. We can look at <clears throat> basic ecological descriptions, um, movements by sex and age. There's a lot of a uh, reasonable amount of work being done on feral cats, but until you're assessing the actual habitat that you're interested in, then uh, which this area was lacking, um, you're not going to get that kind of information. We're interested in habitat use, um, distance from the edge, is there any um, correlation with that preferred habitat, their home range size? We could summarise their basic movement patterns, altitudinal, seasonal, do they come down in the winter when there's a lot of snow up top? Does that make it easier to trap if you've taken out a whole heap of terrain that they're, that they're not actually in? We can also look at um, how individuals might differ from the mean, in that way I mean specialists, like do you have a cat that just sticks to a certain area or just you know, hunts the alpine and he's it's got a um, specialist way of um, finding its prey. <clears throat> There's also questions about trap placement, spacing and timing. How many nights do you leave your traps out for? You could quantify the probability of discovery of traps or devices over time. So talking to this trap placement, it's, it's if you've, even if you've got the flashes gadget re fancy trap in the world, if you place it in the wrong place, it's going to be ineffective. Um, spacing and timing uh, feral cat traps, you know, if you don't have a lot of resources, do you put fewer traps out and space them wider? Are you going to do as good a job as spacing them closer and having a lot more traps? How many nights do you leave them open for? And this answers questions around satellite or cell networks of traps where they're more efficient to leave out for a longer time when you don't have people going around the traps every day. <clears throat> Are alpine cats going to interact with valley floor traps? We've, we don't have a large sample size of that, but it seems that if their movements are large enough, they will come across traps in the valley floor. And look at their hunting behaviour and the spatial risk of predation. So that's not necessarily <clears throat> where they hunt or the overlap between um, feral cat home range and their prey species home range, but where um, they can actually successfully prey on the animals. So it could be, could be different kind of habitat where they can more successfully hunt than just the overlap of where those species are. Um, so this, this slide's not our data, but it's a good example of population level resource selection map. It's actually from the Godi River in Tekapo with feral cats with GPS. And it shows how these data can be mapped in a visual form to show areas of high to low predicted use by feral cats. Um, you can see quite clearly where trapping effort would be best placed and where the highest predation risk might be. 
So that this is done on a population level, but it could also be done for individuals. And you can see how they deviate from the norm, therefore representing a risk to, to certain fauna. Oh, well, I'll just um, like to wrap it up with the acknowledgements. Um, my Manaki Whenua land care research colleagues gave us lots of support and direction throughout this work. And as Sam said, it was funded by our Strategic Science Investment Fund. Um, from science mentors to volunteer field helpers, Andrea Byram and Roger Peck, uh, they were great to bounce ideas off and did many days of trapping for us. Um, Wayne Beggs from Department of Conservation was instrumental in supporting our trapping effort in the Horden Valley. It meant that we could um, leave traps out and run both sides sites at the same time. And Canterbury Aviation carried out the fixed wing aerial tracking in conjunction with the care tracking at similar times. So I'll just leave that there with a um, a nice picture of what we see when we're out aerial radio tracking. This is Turkey Flat in the upper Waimakariri River uh, and open it up to questions. Hi Ivor, thanks for that. We've got quite a few questions coming through so we'll see how many we get through. I'm not sure if you want to turn on your um, video now that uh, we're not going through the rest of the presentation if the bandwidth's okay. So the first question is how easy is it to get location data for the cats if they're under forest and bush cover, which you did uh, touch on during your talk, but have you got anything to add on that? Yeah, we haven't looked at that yet. We do have, we have had some collars out sitting in scrub that we know we're in a certain place, but um, we do need to go back through that and ascertain how well they got fixes in that forest. Right, and have you noticed any differences between male and female home rangers? Uh, we haven't assessed any of that yet, but gut feeling is that um, males range a lot more than females. We've definitely got some home rangers, <clears throat> excuse me, of females that were really quite sedentary. Uh, and then you've got the, the rangy sort of male home rangers, but none of that has been analysed yet. It's just, we're still at the raw data stage. So do you think more frequent fixes would have been more useful for habitat use or is it the seasonal data, hourly fixes and longer battery more valuable in this case? Great question. Um, so at the very beginning we sat down and tried to figure out exactly what we want to answer and you can't answer everything with uh, a certain type of fix rate. So um, that's what we decided on. A little bit coarser but um, for an initial trial that that was the sampling rate that we um, that we settled on, but yeah, if you, if you wanted to look at hunting patterns or um, you know selection or um, movement through a certain habitat, then you would go for more fixes over a shorter period of time. And can you give us a bit of detail on the makeup of the group of cats that were tracked in regards to age and sex? <clears throat> They were, I'd have to go and look at the data, they were mostly adults. There was a couple of juveniles, one didn't last very long, it seemed to die of natural mortality, um, following the sort of beach mast, which is not unexpected. Um, so mostly mostly adults, and I would have thought maybe a 50-50 mix, yeah. I, I don't think it was skewed grossly any either way. So in your opinion, what research on feral cats is still critically missing for understanding their movements and trapping and baiting behaviours for successful control and eradication? Oh, well, <laughs> um, well, how to tackle cats and feral cats in this kind of environment, I guess. Massive landscape with uh, large movements. <clears throat> how do you put all cats at risk? Um, how do you not risk other species while you're trying to do that at the same time. Uh, and you've already touched on this, but what was the 
mortality rate or longevity of the cats studied. So apart from that juvenile, did you have, have any other natural mortality? There were two other natural, well, we think were natural mortalities, but one was near a hut. So, and by the time I went to pick it up, it was pretty well decomposed. Um, so it may have been shot by someone near a hut. Uh, it was around about Christmas time. Uh, and another one we found sort of waterlogged under under a log uh, quite near the Horden shelter. So again, we couldn't uh, positively identify what that cat died of, but it, it may also have been shot by somebody. So when you find a dead care, how do you know what's killed it? <clears throat> so the care that had uh, telemetry um, gear on them, you can track uh, them. It goes into a mortality mode after it's been still for 48 hours. Go and find the carcass, um, keep it sterile, and then it goes off to the laboratory and they swab it for DNA analysis so they can um, take DNA off the bird and, and attribute it to either a stoat or a feral cat or whatever else was there. There's also field sign. Um, you get quite good at determining how stoats attack something and leave a carcass versus uh, feral cats and measuring the canine incisions in the, in the bones is another way of determining between cat and stoat. One's obviously wider than the other. Cool. And so were any of the collared cats killed by predator control during your study? <clears throat> um, there was no formal predator control happening when we carried this out. There is now in the Horden and um, that alpine specialist was one that was killed in their new um, trapping regime. So he was killed three weeks ago. I don't know how long the trapping's been going for. Uh, so there's a, a question here on whether you tried drones to collect data. Uh, no, we didn't. But yeah, possibly um, could be useful. The, pro the problem we had was actually finding them in the first place. So they were, the collars were great when the aerials were on, that was easy. Um, once they were broken off, actually finding them in the first place uh, on foot would, was near impossible. Um, you sort of have to get a plane and then sort of go in there and there. Just break. Oh, there we go. Um, so I have a following on Knowing from that. that it was somewhere yeah, and then um, track it down. Oh, and following on from that, when the aerials were intact, how close did you need to be to get a download off the collars? <clears throat> Out of the plane, I would think maybe a thousand feet above, you could orbit around and download them as fast as anything. Uh, on foot, um, yeah, almost probably from one side of the valley to the, the other, if you had a good vantage point, they were really good. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so do you have any idea of the density of cats in the areas, sort of what proportion of the population that you were following? <clears throat> no, but um, given that we got quite a few recaptures, we could look at a mark recapture study. Um, none of that. You know, we haven't looked at any of that stuff yet. This is just hot off the press pretty much. Yep. So yeah, given given that we got, um, we can look at our catch rates and um, and especially of uh, marked cats recaptures. But gut, and, gut feeling there's probably more cats in the Hope than the Horden. Right. And do you have a feel for, um, the distribution of a singular cat change seasonally, um, as you're suggesting, possibly were they less mobile in winter? No, we haven't we haven't looked at that yet. So do you think here are mainly at risk from male cats given the size discrepancies between males and females? 
Um, no, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. I wouldn't. I wouldn't know, and I wouldn't assume anything. I think uh, once once there's been a rodent crash and predators are desperate, they um, it's desperate times for anything, and they're probably likely to try their luck or or perish. So yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't answer that question. So what's the biggest lesson from this study that you would change for future studies in other locations? Oh, I guess it was um, disappointing that some of the hardware um, didn't didn't work so well with the aerials, but we weren't to know that at the time. Uh, everything else about it went really, really well. Um, this, yeah, given, given we know a little bit more about cats or feral cats in this environment, we would maybe trap slightly differently. We'd uh, space the traps out more, leave them open for a longer period of time, because we found there were sort of pulses in our catch rates. We we would go nights and nights without cats, and then all of a sudden you'd catch a whole heap. And so. Would you feel confident that control or eradication of cats could be successfully carried out with the current tools or technologies we have available? Um, you never say never, but they're, you can see the kind of terrain that they're in and the areas that they are moving over. And <clears throat> we don't have a widespread tool for controlling feral cats. so. Yeah, at this point, I think it would be a a, a pretty hard ask, but um, one that needs to be addressed at some stage. Hmm. Uh, so I've got a question about the um, the fact that bridges could provide a focal point for trapping pests if the resources are limited. Um, do you think there are many cats that used the bridges for crossing? <clears throat> there was only one that used it in our study. Um, and that was a male cat and he was quite, he also used the railway line a lot, whether he's getting sort of road kill, rail, railway kill. Um, but yeah, he, he was obviously quite a individualistic cat that was doing a certain beat. Um, and we, we didn't notice any other feral cats crossing that, river, that uh, bridge. So I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't speculate on that. And so did, the feral cats generally cross large rivers or were they good barriers? Well, both of those rivers, both the Hope and the Horden, I would suspect that a, um, a cat would would be unable to cross either of those rivers without going for a bit of a swim. And they certainly crossed from side to side. So, um, you know, you think of cats not liking the water too much, but these ones seem to cross Across the rivers um, and not think too much about it. We, there's plenty of um, tracking data where they have crossed um, several times. So are there other current research projects you're aware of that focus on feral cat movements or understanding feral cats? Um, <clears throat> not that I'm aware of but I haven't uh, done a lot of looking around. Um, there's a lot being done in dry lands and different habitats, asking different questions. So I think you need to be um, answering specific questions with with different types of research. And uh, when are you expecting to analyse or publish this research? <clears throat> um, analysis is starting to take place now. Cecilia's working on that now. We've uh, used uh, 300 days as the cutoff point for for data analysis, which we've got quite a few collars with that amount of data on. So that that may be months away, and then um, try and get at least the first paper out. Um, not sure, maybe by the end of the year. Cool. Uh, we've got a couple of questions around collars. One um, looking at why you think aerials. Um, broke off and whether there's anything that's um, people looking at to improve them and also any feedback you might have on the drop-off collars and would you recommend their use? Uh, yep, two different questions. So the aerials, they seem to come out at, at a really um, sort of 
strong angle straight up out of the collar and it appears that the feral cats and we also had some on possums were scratching the aerial and just breaking them off so if the aerial was um, kept in the collar for longer and came out near the top maybe that would work or a bit of um, stronger diameter aerial um, wire and the second question was around uh, remote drop-offs, time-release mm -hmm. drop-offs. Now that was a stipulation by our Animal Ethics Committee uh, where we wanted to trial um, lightweight drop-off collars for in case we um, collared lighter cats that were going to grow in, through the course of the study and then that's one way that the collar would definitely come off. Um, to date we haven't, I've got a lot of them sitting back here, but the ones that are still out, we haven't been able to track for quite a while because of the weather. Um, so we'll be hopefully finding out about those soon. They're due to okay. drop off. So it would be good to get the cats back first and see if the um, remote drop off works with the collar that's back here. And what was the highest um, altitude that the alpine specialist reached? Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. I haven't actually looked at that. I'd have to have a look on the map. But yeah, probably one of those peaks out the back of the Horden. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, good question. I'd have to have a look. Um, and did you leave the traps set in the same spot um, for your trapping sessions or did you move them around the landscape? In the hope, we used 40 traps and we kept them in the same spots the whole time. In the hoard, and we did move them around a fair bit, um, just covering a bit more terrain. And it also depended on what the river levels were doing. Sometimes we couldn't work on one side of the river because the river was too high. Um, so, <clears throat> but but even still, when we had traps set in the hope, from day to day, you'd get um, a cat that you'd radio track way down the valley, and the next day it would be in the trap at the top of the top of the valley so um, I think just leaving them out and leaving them open um, was enough it didn't really have to shuffle them around if if they're open for long enough the cats would find them so I had a couple of people asking um, questions about whether you were using any smart trapping network sort of transponders to say that they'd been triggered um, to try and reduce the um, checking time uh, is that something that would have been useful for the study if it had been available to you? Possibly, although somewhere like the Hope Valley, you'd have to be in there regardless because if it told you a trap had gone off, it's pretty remote to try and get in there and you need to check them daily if there was something in there. Um, and then you could be all sorts of weather hold-ups or whatever, but somewhere like the Horden would have been would have been useful. Um, yeah, it just it depends on the... Um, situation and how remote those areas are. Mm. Uh, so do you think cat attacks on kias that didn't result in a kill could have also contributed to a kia mortality through later infection or injury? <clears throat> those mortalities that were recorded in that study were obvious feral cat kills. So we'd, we'd picked up the, the carcass um, that had cat evidence on it. So if I'm thinking about the question right, it would be something that you didn't find or you didn't know about that if, if a bird had got away wounded. Um, mm. but, but the ones in that study were clearly uh, stoat or feral cat. Mm. Oh, there was, actually there was a few unresolved cases. And so how did the attrition rate of your aerials and collars compare with more traditional radio tracking technology? I guess the, the older, more robust collars. Um, yeah, we pretty much lost all the aerials off um, all 20 devices. So it was pretty high attrition rate. Yeah. And um, for the collars that aren't drop off collars, how are you planning to retrieve them? Yeah, so those cats we need to um, either lay out, the open up the trap network again, which is still there. Um, and we've left them in there, or we could um, track them on foot and shoot them. It was surprising actually when you when you needed to download them, how close you could get to them, and you'd never know that they they were there unless you had 
telemetry gear, but we've sighted quite a few of the cats through the bush or river flats when you're tracking in on them. So um, yeah, the idea is to, to euthanize them at the end. Um, and one final question, and then you can go and give your throat a rest, I think. Uh, what were the cats <laughs> eating apart from Kia? Um, yeah, we, well, we picked up a lot of scats, um, all sorts of stuff in those scats. No one's had a look at those yet, but we briefly um, thumbed through a few. Laura's got a fascination with diet of things, so we did find a kaka or a Kia claw in, in one of the scats that we found. But yeah, just... Um, rabbit and other bird material and hair and uh, there's quite a few deer that get shot in the Hope Valley and the cats were um, scavenging on, on those carcasses. Great. Well, thanks for a, um, a really interesting talk, Iga, Iba, and um, we'll see everyone for a talk on thermal cameras and drones tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.